Hello, I'm Jeff Sayer McCord. I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the director of the university's philosophy, politics, and economics program. Today, I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about voting. Suppose you're in a circumstance where you have the opportunity to participate in a large-scale civic election. You might reasonably ask whether you should vote, and if so, why? Let's start with what might be called a clear-eyed and cold-hearted view of voting. This is clear-eyed because it eschews appeals to romanticism. It puts to one side unfounded thoughts of one's vote influencing hordes of other people to vote in the same way you do. And it's cold-hearted because it takes as the relevant consideration the victory of one's favored candidate. On such an account, in large elections, there seems to be no reason to vote. At least that's the standard view, defended influentially by Anthony Downs in An Economic Theory of Democracy back in 1957, and by Mankur Olson in The Logic of Collective Action in 1965. On their view, you need to ask yourself, what's the probability that your vote will make a difference to victory. For any large election that's not expected to be close, the odds that your vote would be the one vote that makes a difference are vanishingly small. So if you have an alternative to voting, maybe watching a good movie or doing a little more work, or getting the sleep you so desperately need, the reasons you have to do that vastly outweigh the reason you have provided by the vanishingly small chance that your vote would make a difference to the outcome. Of course, this assumes that the sole point of voting is to bring about an outcome. A natural place to turn is to warming the heart, to noticing that there are things you might care about other than the victory of a candidate. You might care to express your solidarity with others. You might be concerned to exercise your right to vote. You might hope to minimize regret so that even if your candidate lost, it wasn't because you failed to vote, you might just wish to express your support. Or you might just like wearing an I voted sticker. In any of these cases, you might find yourself independent of the prospects of your vote being decisive to the outcome with reasons nonetheless to vote. Each of these concerns, concerns other than the victory of your preferred candidate might well tip the balance, might well provide the reasons that make it make sense to cast your vote rather than watching a movie, doing a little more work, or sleeping in. Similarly, there may be some good arguments for thinking you have a duty to vote irrespective of the contribution your vote would make to the victory of the candidate you favor. But before turning briefly to those, I'd like to move back to the thought that the reason one would have to vote comes from the role one's voting has in bringing about victory of your candidate. What I'd like to do is spend just a little time on an argument first offered by Alvin Goldman in Why Citizens Should Vote, a Causal Responsibility Account, 
and developed by Richard Tuck in his book, Free Riding. An argument for thinking that Contra, Downs, and Olson, and many, many others, our votes, even in large-scale elections in which we know our vote will not be decisive, our votes, nonetheless, make a causal difference to the outcome much more often than one might have thought. And that this causal difference our votes make means we have much more reason to vote than Olson, Downs, and those many others thought. Here is the Goldman Tuck idea. In order for a vote to count as a cause of an outcome, it does not need to be necessary for that outcome. It doesn't need to be the vote without which victory would not have been secured. It need only be part of what in fact brought about the victory. Just to use simple numbers here, imagine an election that involves a million votes and imagine that it's an election that a simple majority is sufficient for victory. In such a vote, the first 500,001 votes secures the victory, assuming there are two candidates. If your vote is among that 500,001 votes, you count, according to Goldman and Tuck, as being causally responsible for the victory of the candidate. That's true, even if many more than the minimally sufficient set vote in the same way. Consider a landslide in which we anticipate 100,000 votes cast for candidate one, 40,000 votes cast for candidate two. In that case, 40,001 votes cast for candidate one are part of the minimally sufficient set for that candidate to win the election, even though 100,000 votes were cast for that candidate. Ex ante, that means the probability that one's vote for candidate one matters will be roughly 40%. Those are not vanishingly small odds that your vote will matter. Here's a way to put it. Olson and Downs's mistake, according to Goldman and Tuck, is not in thinking that what matters is whether one's vote causes the victory of your favorite candidate. That's right. The mistake is in thinking that the only votes that play that role, that have that impact, that cause the victory, are those without which the victory would not have been secured. So their argument works by supposing it matters whether they are the cause of the victory and not just whether there's a victory. Notice the Goldman Tuck view argues you can be part of a cause without being necessary for the effect. So that if all you were concerned with is the effect, their view of what it takes to be the cause of the effect will not provide any reason for you to vote. Suppose you come to the conclusion that for one reason or another, you do have reason to vote, perhaps a duty to vote. You might reasonably also ask, what else in trying to fulfill that duty might you have a duty to do? Might you have a duty to be informed? A way to think about this is on the slogan, Anything worth doing is worth doing well. And so you might think if it's worth voting, it's worth being very informed about the candidates. But that's a very suspect thought. It seems as if there are a lot of things worth doing that are worth doing even if you don't do them particularly well. And you can't know of voting, whether it's one of those, without figuring out why you have a duty to vote. What role does voting play in the society of which you're a member?
What does failing to vote say when you fail to vote, regardless of the outcome it fails to bring about? These are questions you must ask yourself when you're worried about whether you have reason to vote and why you have reason to vote and for which candidate you have reason to vote.